Good morning. Glad you all came through the snow this morning. It's not going to last long. Are there any announcements? Good morning. So this Wednesday, we are going to be having our dinner at the Fellowship Cup that we do every month. And we're going to have a nice dinner, I think. It's going to be uh, chicken and noodle casserole with some green beans and crusty bread. And I hope we're going to have some dessert. That's where you come in. Uh, so we're looking for maybe three or four, either any kind of a cake, sheet cake or layered cake, whatever you'd like to help with. And if you could just tell me if you could help with that. And you could either bring it to the church or just bring it to the Fellowship Cup uh, 9.30 on Wednesday. Okay. And you're all, anybody can come to that dinner. And it's a lot of fun. And it's only $4. And it's, you know, it's not really a senior meal. It could be. But nobody's going to be carding anybody. <laughs> so you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I know you're all excited about the annual meeting after worship service today. It will be good and informative. Uh, I'm excited about the lunch after church after the annual meeting. And so I want to invite you all to, once the meeting concludes, to just come on down to Fellowship Hall. We have enough baked potatoes and desserts for everybody here. We have big potatoes for those with big appetites and little potatoes for those with little appetites. And uh, there will be plenty for you to come on down for seconds. And not only is it a great time of fellowship for our church, but uh, this is our first fundraiser for our Heifer mission trip. And so there will be a basket down there. And please uh, give generously uh, for the youth mission trip. Thank you very much. Oh, um, and I am going to head back down and guard the Becker chocolate cake with my life. Okay. <laughs> Please join me in the call to worship. With Simon and Andrew, we follow Jesus. How to fish for people. With James and John, we follow Jesus, proclaiming the good news of God. Let us worship God. The opening hymn, page 482.
You may be seated. The call to reconciliation. Nothing can be hidden from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, whose wisdom is endless, whose mercy is great. Please join in the unison prayer for forgiveness. God, our creator, we confess that we are broken, sinful creatures. You call on us to change our lives, yet we do not heed your warning. You give us good news to share, yet we remain stubborn and silent. Forgive us, God of grace. Help us to repent and follow you, bearing witness to the good news that your holy realm is near. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will rise up to fly like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not grow faint. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The Old Testament lesson is from Jonah 1, 1 to 4, and number 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah's son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarnish. From the presence of the Lord, he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarnish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarnish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so.
one quick announcement. At the end of the service, we're going to sing, uh, sing Take My Life, but we are only going to sing verses 1 through 3. So just take note of that. We'll just do verses 1 through 3 for the last hymn today. So, as I've been saying for the past couple of weeks, we are in the season of Epiphany. We are still in that season. Christmas has faded long away. It is completely gone, minus perhaps a lingering piece of candy from a stocking, which is always a joyful find late in January. But while Christmas is gone, we are still marveling at the Christ child, now a grown man. We've been watching him and learning about him over the past several weeks, and that is what the season of Epiphany is all about. Last week, we saw that God in Christ knows us intimately, just like when Jesus knew Nathaniel before they ever met. He knew when Nathaniel was eating underneath that fig tree. And the week before last, we saw that baby in the manger as a grown man getting baptized by John in the Jordan River. And that's when we learned that Jesus wasn't just a great man, but the divine logos, which is a Greek mathematical term. Calling Jesus the divine logos is to say that he is the same as that logical spirit that is wrapped up in mathematical equations like pi and sine and cosine. Things that we see all throughout creation and things like seashells and flowers and ocean waves. Calling Jesus the divine logos is equating him to that wisdom that undergirds all of creation. That is what we saw two weeks ago when John said, you are truly the word of God. And today we meet Jesus again here at the beginning of Mark's gospel where Jesus has began his public ministry. Mark begins with Jesus returning from his time of testing in the wilderness and immediately setting about his core mission to proclaim the arrival of God's imperial rule and to call upon people to turn about and embrace the reign of God, a thing for which they may have no idea about what they're getting into. Our reading for today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. Listen now to these words from our Lord. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most holy God, uphold me so that I might uplift thee. Amen. So do you remember your grammar lessons from seventh grade? Do you remember how your teacher may have emphasized the importance of prepositions and transitional phrases? Do you remember how she may have said or he may have said that those transitions and prepositions were vitally important for understanding the context of a story? Well, prepositions and transitional phrases are just as important for understanding the context of Scripture. So, for instance, when we read a Scripture passage that begins with the phrase like, after that he immediately decided to go, we should ask, after what? What happened that made him immediately decide to go? Why did our gospel writer say that? Asking these questions helps us to understand the context of Scripture. And knowing the context of Scripture then helps us apply that Scripture to our context today. And that is a very important theological move. 
And it's important to understand what's happening in that move. See, because these scriptures aren't about us. These scriptures are about God for us. And so we have to make that turn from taking them where they were and bringing them forward to here to apply them to our lives, to see who God is and how God is for us today. So notice our reading today begins with the phrase, after John was arrested, he went to Galilee. It's important to know what happened immediately before the calling of the disciples. What happened was that John the Baptist was arrested. Roman-powered rulers extended the strength of their might to silence John, to imprison him. So there are some big things at play here. Jesus isn't just leaving the wilderness in the Jordan area to go and take a nice stroll on the Sea of Galilee, where he just happens to find some fishermen. He is literally heading right into the lion's den. He is going right into the Roman province of Galilee. He has just confronted the, the, the powers and principalities of the Roman rule. And now he is leaving a safe Jewish territory that is governed by Roman rule because they're an occupying force to go into an even more Roman ruled area. And he walks into this place knowing that John the Baptist has just been arrested. And he says with authority, the kingdom of thou, meaning Yahweh, not Caesar, is here. Turn and believe this good news. So this would be like walking into Kinnick Stadium, into Hawkeye Territory, and standing on the 50-yard line during a pep rally and chanting, Go Cyclones. <laughs> it's not very smart. Now, I like history. And... The quest for the historical Jesus has dug up some very interesting facts. And one was an inscription from Tiberius talking about Caesar. And the inscription claimed the emperor's good news of prosperity. And there were these notes that came with the inscription. And it talked about all the good that Caesar was doing for all of the provinces of Rome. Caesar was bringing good news. He was bringing jobs, governance, waterways, and construction. That was the good news that Caesar was bringing that was claimed on this inscription from Tiberius. And now Jesus comes in and disrupts all of this. Remember, John was just baptizing people and he got tossed into jail. Jesus screams out in an act of sedition that God's kingdom is here. And he uses the Greek word for God that can be equated to Yahweh. And he says, God's reign is the good news, not Caesar's. And then he called the disciples. This wasn't just a sweet little stroll on the Sea of Galilee. This was an intentional mission to change the world. And so we should hear the call of the disciples in a new context. See, I don't think the disciples had any idea what they were getting into whenever they just dropped their nets and followed Jesus. In fact, I like Jonah's call story a lot better than the disciples because I think Jonah gets it. What does Jonah do? He turns tail and he runs. He knows that heading into God's work is troublesome. And he says, I don't want any part of this. I don't want to go to Nineveh and start saying all of these things. He's smart. Well, it's ordination and installation Sunday. And I know most of you have at least an idea of what you're getting into. But I also know that some of you have tried to run like Jonah too. Oh, 
I know what it's like when that phone rings and it's someone from the ordination committee or the the elder nominating committee. And you're thinking it might be better to be tossed overboard and swallowed by a fish than serve again for another three years on session. (laughs) Too soon? Did you ever hear the one about the man who answered the phone when someone from the nominating committee called and said, you know, I can't do it this year, but maybe my wife can? (laughs) All kidding aside, for your installation and ordination of your elders and your deacons, we all know a little bit about what we are getting into. And this is about all we know. We know God uses ordinary people like you, like me, like Jonah, like the disciples to do extraordinary things. But we also know that sometimes those extraordinary things are extra mundane. It can be as simple as having a revelation of I've been thinking about Mary. Maybe I should give her a call. And you find out that you're walking on holy ground because Mary needed that call. It can be working out the budget numbers again because something just didn't add up. But then we find a blessing that we have more money for our kids to go on their mission trip. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. We can trust that God has something planned for us whenever we start to fish for people in the kingdom of God. But here is the catch. Here is the catch for us. Sometimes we have to go fishing for fishing spots. Sometimes we have to fish for fishing spots. So let me explain what I mean. We have to be discerning about what we have gotten ourselves into. So here's a story. It's about my grandpa. Bless his heart. I loved my grandpa. He was a successful, smart man. And he always smoked these stinky, smelly cigars everywhere he went. King Edward cigars had boxes of them all over the place. And he used to take my dad and I fishing with him. My dad and I would be put in charge of loading up my grandpa's old red truck. And he had this old beat up Ford with a, with a camper on the back. And it was his fishing truck. And my grandpa would supervise as my dad and I loaded up the nets and the poles and the chairs and all of this stuff and the stink bait. He made his own stink bait. He was so proud of it and my granny hated that source of pride (laughs) because he would let it brew on the back porch for days and weeks. It was good. It, It worked. It worked. So we would go... And we would pack all this stuff up, and we would head down to the coast. And we would pull up to a jetty near the bay in Galveston, and we would get out of the truck, leaving all of the gear, and we would walk out onto that jetty. And my grandpa would walk out on the jetty, and he would do this kind of maneuver where he would posture himself and put his hands on his hips, and he would sniff the air. And he would look. And most of the time, he would just kind of shrug and walk down a little bit, maybe kick a shell or something like that. Then he'd, then he'd ask some other people who were fishing there, how's it going? And he was just being polite because he already knew. He was like a barometer for fish. He really was. And so they would say, it's not so great. And we would walk back to the truck. We would load back up and we would, we would drive down for who knows how long to the next jetty or to the next inlet. And we would get out, and we'd go through this whole routine again. My grandpa would get out. He'd stare at the water. We would stare at him, trying to see what he was seeing. And then he would gruff and turn around and get back in the truck without saying a word. And by the end of the night, this would happen for hours and hours and hours. And by the end of the night or late into the night, my dad and I wouldn't even get out of the truck anymore. Now, this was before smartphones and handheld games, so I was just going mad. There was nothing I could do. I was trapped in this truck with these smelly cigars and stink bait and my dad, and we were fishing for fishing spots. 
That is what my dad always said. Coolly and calmly, he would pull his hat down and he would say, Grandpa's just fishing for fishing spots. But then it would happen. We would pull up to a place and you knew it was it before we would get out because you could see the people with the tight lines or pulling in their nets with their catches. And my grandpa would get out and he'd sniff the air and you could just sense something in the air. And he'd say, get the chairs. And he would stand there still looking at the water with his hand out, waiting for my dad to hand him a net or a pole. And within the hour, we could catch our limit. It was always amazing, but boy, we were not always happy about how we ended up in that place. We rarely knew what we were getting into any time we went fishing with my grandpa. But here was the thing, and this is what's important for our lives as elders, as deacons, as leaders in the community, as leaders in our own families. He had a discerning spirit. And he was able to discern and take in his environment, what was going on around him, what was needed, and when to stay, when to go, and what to do. And we learned to trust that discerning spirit, that he had something planned, and he knew how it was going to work. I don't know that he always knew that it was going to work, because there was one fishing trip where we literally never found that fishing spot. We drove for hours and hours and hours, but we did end up on a pier eating hog's head cheese. I will never do that again. (laughs) That's just to say, sometimes we don't know what we're getting into. We're not always happy, but we were always together, and we always found that it was for the best. In life, we can never know absolutely what we are getting into. Whether it's doing some small task that has extraordinary consequences like calling on a friend, or going fishing, or getting installed as elders and deacons in the church, we can't always know what we're getting into. But I pray that we can trust that God has a plan and that we can be discerning with the Spirit of God to figure out the best fishing places to fish for people of God. Let us pray. Most holy God, bless us as we fish for fishing spots in your kingdom. Bless your new leaders that they may be discerning about where to cast their nets. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Let us pray. We praise and thank you, Lord God, for the majesty of your work, the wisdom of your word, and the generosity of your grace. Let the gifts of our lives bear witness to your goodness and mercy, your faithfulness and justice, and your steadfast love for all. Amen. You may be seated. Will the elders and deacons please step forward, the elders and deacons to be installed and ordained. So during the doxology, these folks walked forward as a symbolic offering of their lives in service of the church. They probably have no idea what they are getting into, but here they are, ready to serve. And we pray for a discerning spirit as they seek to lead us, to nurture us, to care for us, and to make decisions and govern for us. Today, we will ordain Betty Lowe as an elder in the church. And we will ordain the deacons Levi Boston Kemple, Adam Krieger, and Mike Vincent. Now, I know Jason's name is up there to be ordained, but he has been ordained already and served as an elder. So we are just going to install Jason. And we're going to install these elders, Barbara Wielander, Claudia Streeter, and Mary Beth Young. So I will ask you to reaffirm your baptismal vows because the grace bestowed upon you in baptism is sufficient because it is God's grace. And by grace we are saved and enabled to grow in faith into people who have been nurtured, who can now serve to nurture others. So I now invite you to reclaim that grace. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in this world? Do you? Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? Do you? Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Will you? Will the congregation please stand? We will now reaffirm our faith together as a unified body of Christ. Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? So today is a special day in the life of the church when we get to ordain elders and deacons. So anyone who has ever been ordained as an elder, deacon, or pastor in the history of their lives because we accept one baptism, I would ask that you come forward to lay your hands on the elders and deacons. If y'all would step forward so we can have people get up. And if you can't get up to to one of the uh, elders or deacons, then I would just ask that you lay your hands on someone who's there. Now, we have folks who are here who are being installed, but they're going to lay their hands on the folks who are being ordained. And so we're going to have a prayer of ordination for our deacons and then a prayer of ordination for our elders and feel the power of Christ flowing through you. And then we will have a prayer for their installation and prayers of the world and our Lord's prayer. Let us pray for the ordination of our deacons. God of love and compassion, you poured out your life and service in your son, Jesus Christ. By word and example, he taught us to find fulfillment in giving ourselves and greatness in serving others. Bless those called to be deacons 
who lead us in service and caring. Empower them by the grace of your spirit that your whole church may give its life for the sake of the world in the name of Jesus Christ and for elders in the church. God of righteousness and truth, you brought us into your church to show in our life together something of the orderliness of your creation and the love of Jesus Christ. Bless those called to be elders that they may govern wisely and fairly. Give them full measure of your spirit that they may refresh your people along the journey of faith, discerning, teaching, and sharing the word of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. And now, for those who are members of the larger body of Christ, if you would come forward to offer your hands in prayer for all of your elders and deacons. So even if you've not been ordained, please come forward. This is not very Presbyterian, but it's very Christian. Get close together. Act like you like each other. This is a holy moment in God's church where hands through hands that have touched hands that have touched Christ touch each other in a moment of prayer. So let us pray for our officers in the work of the church. Let us pray. Most holy God, through the mouth of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you said to us, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We pray, therefore, for the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into this harvest. We have people who have responded to your divine command, O Lord, and we sincerely beseech you to richly bestow upon them the Holy Spirit so that all of these who are called to your ministry may enter it with a humble attitude, with great joy, with no fear, but trusting in your steadfast love. We pray for them that your power may be poured out upon them so that your kingdom may come and your will may be done so that we can meet the needs of the world. We pray all of these things in Christ's name who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Actually, stay standing to read and sing our hymn. Go to your seats, though.
Lord, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering. Honor all people, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.